I mean, Barossa is that battle where you see just how damn good British infantry of this period is. In Spain, he is just considered a very safe pair of hands, you know. He is a good battalion commander. I, I would argue probably the best battalion commander of the entire campaign. Could it be true? Was the man we are discussing today the best battalion commander of the entire Peninsular War? Well, today I'm joined by the man's biographer, Dr. Christopher Bryce, to learn all about who he was and see if he was indeed as good as his supporters claim. But who was it? Let's find out. Hi guys, welcome back to the Redcoat History Channel, the place for military history geeks like us. My mission is to rescue brave and fascinating characters from the dustbin of history and to share their stories as widely as possible. Today is the first of a short three-part series about Sir Hugh Gough of the 87th Regiment of Foot, the Royal Irish Fusiliers. In subsequent episodes, we'll be looking at his service in the Irish Rockite Rebellion, and then later during the Chinese and Punjab campaigns. My guest Christopher Bryce has written a book about Gough called Brave as a Lion. That can be purchased via Helion, H-E-L-I-O-N dot co dot UK. Just put in the discount code LION in capitals 2020 at checkout to save 20%. In today's episode, we're focusing on Gough's early life, especially his leadership during the Peninsula War of 1808 to 1814. Chris even claims that Goff was the best battalion commander in the entire Allied army. Let's hear more. He's an Irishman from uh, Limerick, and he's part of an old Anglo-Irish family. For anyone who doesn't know, especially if maybe they're listening outside the UK, by Anglo-Irish, we generally mean these were people who were born in Ireland, but of English stock, and they're generally Protestant. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, the, the Protestant thing's a bit more complicated because they're not all necessarily. Um, but yes, really, we mean the um, people of, of Brit British, mostly English stock, who have lived in Ireland for generations. I mean, the Goths went back many, many centuries um, in Ireland. God save Ireland. And his father, George Goff, was quite a prominent uh, landowner, but also, a, um, I suppose the best way of saying it is he was sort of like a military magistrate. He had the roles of magistrate, but he was also the colonel of the local militia. And that's actually how Goff gets his first uh, taste of the military life at uh, the age of just 13. Um, he's uh, given an officership within the... Limerick militia commanded by his father, um, which was not, you know, it sounds strange for a 13 year old to be uh, an army officer, but not in those days. That wasn't uncommon at all, really. And he's not actually in the militia for very long at all. By seven, I mean, he joins the militia in 1793. By 1794, I think it's August, he's actually commissioned into the regular army. Um, so still only 14, 15, you know, he's been commissioned into the regular army. Uh, obviously, this is the period of the Napoleonic Wars, where there's a great demand for uh, officers. There are, are newly raised regiments, and in fact, he joins the, um, the 119th Regiment of Foot, um, which is one of those that's been fairly recently raised to, to add new uh, battalions and regiments to the British Army. But he doesn't stay with them for very long either. I mean, the only real interesting thing about his time with the 100. Uh, 19th is when he is uh, appointed their adjutant you know 14 15 years old is the adjutant of the battalion um which is is quite remarkable i mean i'm i'm guessing i might be wrong but i'm guessing he got the job because nobody else wanted it but he doesn't stay with with the 119th long he's transferred to the 78th foot uh which is a highland regiment and it's with the 78th that he sees his first real action and that's in the uh the first taking of cape town um as he's part of that force he's there at the battle of uh, of, of cape town he also actually we're fairly certain we can't tell for sure but it's suggested uh that he actually takes part or is present at the naval battle of uh saldana bay 
And what do we know about uh, Hugh Goff's time during that campaign? Do we do we have many sources about what he got up to? We have some. We don't have a huge amount. Um, there is a slight problem in that a lot of his private papers were held at the house of his son-in-law, Patrick Grant, and they were destroyed in a fire. Oh. We do know that uh, he, while still in South Africa, he actually transfers from the 78th to the 87th. And the 87th foot, uh, better known as the Royal Irish Fusiliers in later years, um, are probably a regiment more to his liking. I mean, it's an Irish regiment, obviously. It probably uh, says something about that. But also, this is a regiment that's going to see fairly serious active service. Uh, the 78th, though, obviously, they're in Cape Town, but that's probably going to be the end, to a large extent, of their service during the conflict because they're off to garrison in India. And obviously, while there is fighting going on in India, it's far, it, you know, it's a backwater. Mm. Um, the 87th are going to take part in any major European conflict. They're earmarked for that. So being in the 87th is, is something important for him. Um, but his first period of time, really, you know, with the 87th is in uh, the Caribbean. Um, and he's there at the taking of Trinidad. He's there in the battles for Puerto Rico, um, the Dutch colonies in South Africa, uh, South America, sorry, when they're taken. By Suriname. Suriname, yes. Um, you know, he, he, he plays a fairly active part in that for a couple of years, for a few years. And then he returns to, um, to England and he has a period where he's in... Uh, garrison with the uh, 87 uh, in Guernsey actually and then in uh, 1805 um, as part of the expansion of, of the British army just during this period uh, a second battalion is added to the 87th and Goff uh, transfers over to the second battalion with the rank of major um, and then you have a period of a couple of years where the uh, 87th second battalion are Again, they're in garrison in Guernsey, they're in garrison in Ireland, and throughout this time they're training, they're growing, they're developing, they're becoming a serious fighting unit. And then obviously they're part of the force sent to expand the conflict in the Spanish Peninsula. Um, and here we have a situation where Goth is, is a major, but he ends up taking the battalion to Spain as its commanding officer, because the two officers above him in rank in the second battalion both have other appointments uh one is on as a liaison officer with the spanish army if i remember correctly and the other has a role uh, in guernsey uh, a semi-official military role which he can't leave so because there are these two officers who are serving elsewhere the command devolves upon goff and goff takes the battalion off to war and how old would he have been at this point more or less. He was about 30, I believe. Um, so that's quite impressive to essentially be commanding a battalion uh, going yeah. into combat at 30. It was. Um, you know, he must have been one of the younger. I did I did do some research looking into this at one stage, and there were, I was surprised, there were quite actually, there were younger commanders, battalion commanders, than Goff in the peninsula. Um, which was quite a surprise. And, and 30 was probably, it was almost sort of average age, I suppose. Really? Um, it is quite surprising uh, that, you know, there's some, I suppose average age is perhaps wrong because there's some very old battalion commanders, but there's some very young. So, the, the, you know, so I suppose the average comes somewhere in the middle. Um, and presumably, as was the norm for his time, Goff uh, brought, brought most of his promotions. I doubt he'd seen enough action to be promoted uh, without having to buy but buy, buy each successive rank. Do you, do yes, you know anything he, about he, that? He certainly bought his uh, his promotion to major. Um, and actually, there was a uh, there was an officer who um, basically left the army slightly early so that Goff could make his next move. Um, and it was done as a, it was done as a favour, really, as much as anything. Really, so. Okay. I'm technically going to go on for another couple of years, but I'll sell out now so that you can take the promotion because, and I think it's probably another one where this officer, the major in question, didn't want 
uh, to go on active service. Um, and was probably quite keen, you know, to, to sell out. Yeah, makes sense. And, and then so the battalion gets sent to the peninsula. Uh, what, what, what's their track from there? Because I, uh, you know, I know a little bit about what happens, but not the full story. So where, where do they start? Well, they start off, um, I mean, obviously, they start off in Portugal. Um, but uh, their, their first major action is at Talavera. Um, and the 87th, July 1809. Yes, and it's part of the uh, uh, unit that's rather taken by surprise uh, when the French come on in attack. And actually, the 87th, like the whole of their um, brigade, are actually uh, sitting down with their, you know, relaxing because they don't think the French are going to come on. And is this the, the night attack on. on the Medellin? Is it that one? Yes, that's correct, yeah. And the, the 87th, they, they suffer fairly uh, heavy casualties during the, the, this first little period of Calavera because it's not a, it's not a particularly well-organised battle in many senses. Um, you may well be aware that there's quite a bit of, or there was at the time, and there still is today to a lesser extent, a bit of controversy over whether Talavera is really a British victory or not, mm. um, because the losses are quite heavy. Uh, Wellington loses 25% of his, his army strength at, uh, at Talavera, and he actually ends up obviously having to retreat from the field. Now, I think in fairness, we have to say that even though he'd lost 25% of his strength, he didn't intend to retire. It was only when he realised Marshal Salt was coming in his direction, I think it was Salt, was coming in his direction with more men than uh, he imagined. I mean, I think there was an army of 50,000 Frenchmen coming. Uh, and, you know, Wellington didn't have the sort of force to do that, to fight that sort of uh, battle. So he started to retreat towards Portugal. There is actually an interesting little story connected with Goff in the aftermath of Talavera. He's Goff is wounded um, by a cannon shot uh, in his side and also some damage in his legs at uh, Talavera. Um, and he is one of the, <clears throat> you might know in the, in the aftermath of the battle, um, the British are going to withdraw and the Spanish, the Allies, mm. are going to remain in place to sort of cover the retreat. Well, shortly after Wellington withdraws, the Spanish decide to withdraw as well. Now, this is a problem because the uh, a lot of the wounded have been taken away in wagons. Those who they couldn't get wagons for or who were considered too ill to go were left behind, knowing that the Spanish would be there and they wouldn't fall into French hands. Well, suddenly the Spanish leave and you've got, I think it's a couple of thousand British uh, wounded who are just left to the mercies of the French. Goff is one of those, but absolutely determined not to become a prisoner. He literally crawls away to the to a wood, um, not too far away, with another officer, an officer from the, uh, the Connaught Rangers, as they would become, uh, the 88th at the time. Um, and they hide out until they can recover sufficiently, and then they make their own way back on foot to the army. I mean, it's Amazing. a remarkable little story. I tried to find out more detail about that. It's mentioned in both the regimental histories, the regimental history of the 87th and the 88th. There's no great detail and there's no great sources or anything. It's just one of these stories that's been recorded, but nothing more than that. But I think that's, it's very much a marker to the man. You know, that's a, that's a typical goth action um, that he would, you know, he would literally crawl away rather than be taken prisoner. Yeah, that is that is quite an impressive feat, and and presumably then he had to 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 hike a good probably couple of hundred kilometres or whatever it must have been to get back to British lines. Yes, I mean I guess so. I mean we don't know exactly how he did get back to British lines, uh, which again would be an interesting story <laughs> to, to know. But there, there seems very little um, about this, and if Goff ever did record his own thoughts regarding this, and he wasn't a great one for writing down his own thoughts, really. Um, it would probably have been one of those papers that was destroyed in the in the fire mm. at his son-in-law's house. Um, so yeah, it, it's a shame we don't know more about it because it is just a fascinating story. But it's one of those that you know it fits the man perfectly. Yeah, 
So do we do we get a sense by this point of the war then that, that he is a bit of a potential high flyer? Are we are we seeing signs that this is a guy who's going to be probably one of the best battalion commanders of the campaign and will eventually go on to, you know, to achieve very high um, rank? I think I think there's probably a case to be made for that. Part of the, the, the issue is and there's a wider there's a wider problem here. In that, obviously, um, Goff is a bit of an outsider within the British Army. Um, that this, this happens throughout his career. Uh, he's not really one of the the smart set. You know, he doesn't have great links to the Duke of Wellington or to the Duke of York or or someone who's going to you know great patronage that's going to take him through. There are people who think very highly of him, like uh, Sir John Doyle. And also later on, Sir Thomas Graham as well, who hides him in, holds him in extremely high regard. But these aren't really the key movers and shakers in the army. I think the fact as well that the 87th is, is an excellent unit. There's an unfortunate incident um, not too long after Talavera where they, they rather get tarred with an unfair brush. Um, as you may well know, during the winter period, there's quite a lot of Ill, Ill discipline in the British Army. There's, there's a major problem with this. Now, there's nothing to suggest that the 87th is any worse than anyone else. Um, and it would seem that any ill discipline in the 87th is probably average. Now, what happens is they're in battalion with the, the sorry, they're in brigade with the 88th. Uh, later the Connaught Rangers, as I say. Both being Irish regiments, I think they'd rather get tarred with the same brushes, you know, oh, it's, it's just the Irish being difficult. And so the yes, 88... Didn't, didn't Pickton famously call them the footpads, the, the royal footpads or something like that? Yes, yes, yeah. And it, it's, a, it's a tricky one because Wellington rather takes against the 87th and by association probably golf. And... I think, as far as I can make out, I would suggest that this is a mistake on Wellington's part. It's either he's misremembered the 88th caused trouble, or no, it's the 87th, you know, because one number, they're both Irish regiments. It is easy to get them confused, yeah. even myself. And, you know, um, and obviously Wellington as well had a very low opinion of the Irish, despite being part of that Anglo-Irish ascendancy himself. Um, I mean, you know, and I don't want to go off a great tangent, but just to say briefly, that's a great difference between Goth and Wellington. Wellington was an Irish born man who wanted nothing to do with Ireland, really, in that sense. He, he sort of disowned his Irishness. Goth was a man who very much owned his Irishness. He was very, he was extremely Irish, if I can put it that way. Um, he had a strong Irish brogue. Uh, he was a proud Irishman. He saw no conflict in the fact that he was a proud Irishman and an officer of the British Army. So I suppose to go back to your original question, yes, there is an element in which, yes, I think he's, he's certainly growing in reputation. Um, I think his reputation grows yet further in, in a few years time when we're talking about, say, um, uh, Barossa. Certainly, the Battle of Barossa, which we can go on to talk about. Um, yeah, I think I think I think I might uh, steer us in that direction shortly. And, and the siege of Tarifa as well, where Goff and the eighty seventh play a very prominent part. But again, here's part of the problem: this is all under Sir Thomas Graham's command. And Barossa, Tarifa, they all get rather overlooked to an extent because there's no Wellington. You know, there's no Wellesley, there's no Wellington. Um, it's an independent command of Sir Thomas Graham, who's actually a hugely underrated commander. I don't think he gets anywhere near the amount of, of credit he deserves. Um, later on in the conflict, as you, you're probably aware, uh, Wellington makes great use of him as a divisional commander. Um, he's one of, probably one of the more able uh, junior commanders during the Peninsular War. Yeah. Well, for anyone who doesn't know, of course, Sir Thomas Graham only started soldiering in his 40s as well, didn't he? Yes, uh, exactly. After the death of his, his wife. So he's definitely a fascinating character. And, and I think that's a great point to sort of fast forward on a little bit then after, after his near capture 
uh, at Talavera to the Battle of Barossa. So presumably then, uh, and you, you may uh, uh, give any specific information, but his unit then, the 87th, gets sent down to the siege of Cadiz and they find themselves under Sir Thomas Graham. And, and what happens next? Can you give us a quick overview and then into the, into the glorious Battle of Barossa and how the 87th proved themselves? Yes. I mean, Cadiz is under siege, but it's a rather strange siege. It's a land siege, very much. But there's nothing to stop supplies going into Cadiz. There's nothing to stop troops going in and coming out because the Royal Navy commands the sea. So really what they're doing more than anything, the French are bottling up the British presence in, in that southern part of Spain. The thing is, what it's actually doing as well is it's uh, committing an awful lot of French troops to the, to the siege, uh, which actually is detrimental to the French to an extent. Um, but there is a determination on the part of the British to break the siege of Cadiz. And the idea is to basically sail out using the, the dominance at sea and land a little bit further around the coast and basically attack the French, you know, you suddenly in the rear of the French force. And this is where we get the Battle of Barossa. Now they're actually doing this in cooperation with the Spanish. So it, it's, it's a bit of a, unusual one in the sense that the, the Spanish are fighting as allies and Graham is actually um, technically under Spanish command. Uh, the Spanish officer is senior um, but Graham has a degree of independence and I, and I think this I'm trying to remember exactly but he does have secret orders that basically he is allowed to act if he thinks that the British army is at risk He's allowed to disobey the, you know, he's under Spanish command, but he has a degree of responsibility to look after the British army. And if he feels it's at risk, he can disobey the Spanish command. Um, and he does actually do that at uh, Barossa to an extent. And it's one of these attempts just to try and, and I'm going to do this very briefly, and it's probably someone will criticize me and say, I haven't got this quite right, but, you know, the attempt is to try and force the uh, break the siege of Cadiz. They land along the coast. They move inland. They come across uh, a very large um, French presence uh, coming in. There's there's a hill that has been stationed with Spanish and British troops. The Spanish unilaterally remove themselves from the hill. They fly away from the the, the scene. They start to withdraw. Um, and Sir Thomas Graham is adamant that they're not going to withdraw. Now, there's a strange incident where there's a, uh, there's a Major Brown commanding a um, composite battalion, and it, it's made up of all sorts of, of, of different companies of, of various... Um, it was flanking companies, I think, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, uh, well, actually, and some of it's units that have been put into garrison um, because they're the under strength. Yeah, and if, I, if I can find it, I've, I've got it somewhere. I'm sure I have. Because uh... I think Blakeney of the 28th was with that battalion, as I recall, and, <laughs> and has left yes. an amazing account of the battle. Yeah, it is the flank battalions. Um, and it's two companies of the 28th, as you say. Uh, companies from the 1st Battalion, the 9th East Norfolk. The 2nd Battalion, the 82nd which was later the Prince of Wales Volunteers. Um, and so you've got a, an odd mixture there <clears throat> yeah. of, of troops. And I think this is one of those one of those periods where I think we see the strength of British infantry. And I think we see it that it's more than just a battalion esprit de corps system. You know, the, these were made up of different battalions. This was not one composite unit. This was what, not one dedicated battalion with a tradition and a discipline, etc. These were just units thrown together. They've had to withdraw from the hill because the Spanish have. Then Sir Thomas Graham rides up to Brown and says, no, I need you to go back and take the hill. And Brown famously says something along the lines, well, you know, do you want me to fight the French army single-handed? Um, and well, unfortunately, that's exactly what Sir Thomas wants him to do, um, to buy time for the rest of the British army to come out of the, the, the woods and to, to get into line, he needs Brown to basically charge up this hill, 
in the face of, of half the French army. Um, and it's a remarkable thing that they go up there within the first few seconds, the first sort of volley from the enemy, they lose half their strength, both in terms of officers and men, but they don't withdraw. They don't fall back. They keep going. They keep trying to push up that hill. And this is where you see something. I mean, Barossa is that battle where you see just how damn good British infantry of this period is. Now, you know, the discipline, whatever it is, there is something here, discipline tactics that make it such a, a phenomenal force. Um, and then obviously, as Brown has bought the time, the battalions start to come out. The 87th got very sensibly on the edge of the wood because the French are, are marching forward. There's artillery fire on the edge of the wood. He basically lines up his battalion. He gets it in good order so that as they emerge from the wood, they're in, they're in perfect discipline. They're in perfect order. You then get the famous uh, duel with the, um, with the French battalion, which I, if I remember correctly is the eighth, the eighth light. Um, and, you know, they come forward. Um, there's a duel of musketry, which the British probably slightly do better on. Um, and then it's, it's the old fashioned uh, bayonet charge by the British. Goff moves the battalion forward, bayonets to the front they smash through the French battalion. Um, then you get the famous taking of the of the eagle. Um, By Sergeant yeah. Masterson and Ensign Keogh, wasn't it? Yes, um, Keogh obviously dies in the attempt. Uh, Masterson grabs hold of the eagle and there's that great <laughs> line, uh, Bejabers boys, I have their cuckoo. Um, I don't know Classic. whether it's true or not. but I'd I want to get a t-shirt made with that on it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and actually, interestingly, uh, later on in the battle, um, it looks like they actually capture a second eagle, but the, the 87, but they're not able to hold on to it. Um, it's sort of captured and then it's lost again um, with the ferocity of the fighting. They completely destroy the 8th uh, Light French Battalion. Um, but then there's a remarkable point after that, which rather gets forgotten. In the fact that in all this, you know, drama of the taking of the eagle, of the driving off of the 8th Light Battalion, there's another French battalion on its way turning towards them, and it's the 45th. Uh, the fact that they're coming up is, is, is made clear to him by um, Graham. Graham sends over a messenger to say, look, here they come, face them. You know, if you can imagine, you've just smashed through an enemy battalion. There's people running off all over the place. Just the, the chaos that would be in that situation. Goff is able to bring together four to 500 of his men quickly, gets them into line. Now, what would you do in those situations? Would you hold position whilst the enemy comes on and, and fire at them? Perhaps you would. Perhaps a sensible command would do that. Goff fixed bayonet's charge. You know, he charges with just four to 500 men, the French battalion that's coming on, relatively fresh. And they smashed through the, 40, uh, the 45th as well. It, it's, amazing. it's an amazing example. I mean, the bravery it is one thing, the discipline, but also this tactical doctoring of just, you know, charging and if later in his career, Goff rather gets pigeonholed for um, being a very, you know, charge, bear its fixed, attack, front on thing, one can understand why from battles like this, he has seen British infantry drive off units of an army that has conquered most of Europe, that has been almost unbeatable to this point in, in history. And we are now seeing British infantry just smashing through them. Now, once you've seen that, you can understand why if Goff gets a mindset where he believes in the invincibility almost of British infantry. Um, and so Barossa is an important milestone, not only in the development of his career, but I think also in the development of his mindset. 
Um, and, and, you know, and Barossa is just one of those fascinating campaigns. And it's interesting because afterwards as well, Sir Thomas Graham, you know, when <clears throat> things go wrong, they end up back in Cadiz. Uh, Graham has won a victory, but he can't push it home because the Spanish refuse to come to the field, basically. Other than the Spanish cavalry, uh, the Spanish army doesn't really take part in the campaign at all. So we get this situation where Graham goes back and eventually Graham is, is, is removed from uh, command in Cadiz and promoted. And on his leaving uh, Cadiz, there are numerous requests for him to dine with this regiment or this organization or ever so. He refuses all of them except the 87th. He goes and has dinner with the 87th. But I think that's an element of just how high regard he had for Goth and his battalion during this period. And there's a later date in, in, in the Peninsula War where Graham is anxious to have the 87th under his command again. So, <clears throat> you know, um, this is a, a real key element, key period in the development of Goff's career. Brilliant. And, and so after Barossa then, and you said he was quite unpopular with Wellington, did things change? And can you give us just a brief overview of, of how the battalion and particularly Goff, how the rest of their, their campaign went in the peninsula? Well, after this period, obviously, they, they have suffered losses <clears throat> at Barossa. They're very much confined to Cadiz. They later take part in the defence of Tarifa. Um, Tarifa is one of the, uh, another, there are sort of three main ports along this area with Cadiz, Gibraltar and Tarifa. But Tarifa is the easy target for the French, you know, Gibraltar and Cadiz are hard nuts to crack. <clears throat> Tarifa has some defences, but they're very old defences. Uh, they're not theoretically going to stand up to modern artillery bombardment. Um, and so extra British troops are rushed into Tarifa, including the 87th. <clears throat> there's a siege, there's an attack on Tarifa, which the 87th play a prominent part uh, in, in forcing back. Um, you know, and again, it just adds to the, the reputation of the 87th and the reputation of Goff. You know, he's becoming well known at home. Uh, one of the few sources I did have uh, around this period, because a lot of the correspondence lost, are letters to... Uh, between Goff and his wife, uh, Francis Goff. Now, Francis has uh, keeps up a, a regular correspondence, and these letters still exist. And I was very kindly uh, lent them by the present Viscount Goff, uh, and allowed to look through them and, and, and you know, quote from them. And there are some remarkable things in there, and you can tell that. Francis Goff is perhaps hearing more about her husband's reputation than he is in the peninsula. You know, people are inviting Francis Goff to various events because of who her husband is. Um, and there's a growing reputation that she's experiencing rather than Hugh's experience in, in, in the peninsula. So there is a growth, but really, I suppose in, in, in Spain, he is just considered a very safe pair of hands. You know, he is a good battalion commander. I, I would argue probably the best battalion commander of the entire campaign. Wow, uh, that's, know, a, that's, a, that's a big claim. Yeah, and I know there are others who would support me in that claim as well. Um, you know, they're always going to... It's one of those debates you can have, you know, who's, who's the greatest footballer, who's the greatest cricketer, who's the greatest whatever you're going to get numerous opinions and there's never going to be a key answer. But I think you can make a strong case for Goff, which is probably the best you ever can do when you're looking at something and saying, oh, he's the best this or he's the best that. You can put a very strong case uh, for Goff and the 87th. They go through the remainder of the, uh, of the campaign. They're at Victoria. Uh, they're at Nivelle, although at Nivelle, this is where Goff leaves the battalion because he's quite seriously wounded. Um, and he misses the rest of the Peninsular War. And by the time he's basically fit and well again, uh, the campaign, the, the war in that sense is over. Obviously, we get the 100 days a bit later on. Um, during the 100 days, the battalion, under Goff's command, the 2nd Battalion, are in garrison in Guernsey. 
Now, I've never found a satisfactory explanation as to why they were not part of the force sent over to, uh, to fight at Waterloo. They remain in garrison in Guernsey. Now, I mean, you can argue, or perhaps it was considered that there was a threat to Guernsey or something. I don't think there was, um, you know, with the new Napoleonic France in that sense. I don't think there really was that. And I don't understand, and I've never really found a good reason why. And they were slightly under strength, but so were many of the battalions. I was about to say, most were, weren't they? Yeah, exactly. Um, so I don't think that's really, a, you know, a reason for it either. So I've never quite understood why, but they weren't at Waterloo, the second battalion in the 87. Well, Chris, before we before we wrap up this period, um, are there hmm. any other standout moments that you've come across from Gough and the 87th during the rest of the peninsula after Barossa? I mean, you mentioned some of the battles they were in. Are there any other standout moments that you, you found interesting or, or that shine a light on his character during that period? I mean, to, as I said, Tarifa is important. And when Tarifa is attacked by the French, um, there's a, uh, a portcullis in the old defences, which, as I should say, shows you how old the defences were, which is strongly defended by the uh, the 87th um, in, in hand-to-hand combat to an extent. Um, and the portcullis actually becomes a symbol for Goff and is part of his coat of arms later on. Um, Tarifa is a campaign that, again, is completely forgotten, um, but it, it's an important one to golf. And again, it shows his, uh, the great um, skill, I suppose, of, of leading a battalion in combat. Um, what if, whatever else we might say about golf in his later career, there's no doubt that <clears throat> he was a great leader of men. Um, they loved him. And I think largely that was because he took the same risks they did. You know, he was never uh, backward in coming forward, as they used to say. You know, he was always with them on the front lines. He shared their hardships. He shared their dangers. Um, you know, he, throughout his career, he was wounded any number of times. Um, so, you know, he is a man who, who leads from the front. Um, which is great when you're a colonel of a battalion, not so good when you're a general commanding an army. There's a story at Barossa, which is, is, isn't true. But it says that he uh, engaged in a personal duel with the battalion commander of the 8th uh, and uh, cut his head off. You know, it, it isn't true because the battalion commander lived for many, many years afterwards. Um, but it's one of these things that it, this is the growing reputation of Goff that these stories start developing about him. Um, you know, that, that he's the guy who's, who's, I think there's even a painting somewhere of this or, or, or a wood carving or something of him engaging in duel and then swiping the, <coughs> the colonel's head off. And, and it just didn't happen. Well, let's not let the truth stand in the way of a good story. Okay guys, please subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Don't forget that you can also subscribe to my newsletter over at redcoathistory.com and you can listen to a longer version of this on your podcasting app. All right guys, take care.